I got to work with KD. I got to work with LeBron. I got to work with Kobe. You know, whether that shoe sell, sold out or not, it was like, yeah, I did my job that day. Because right, like right. Kobe, yeah. Kobe loved the concept. Yeah. So what's the price on the is, mid right now versus the high? Uh, I don't know because I don't buy mids for retail. <laughs> Team mid over here. Hey, hold up. I'm going to look into the camera for this one. MJ wore mids. And I like, remember someone up. told me that they were there. It's one of the biggest shoe regrets of my life, not going and getting a pair. I got 22 I pairs. Like, wow. So they're like, yo, you're working with so-and-so this week. And you're like, oh, Bo people. Jackson. Bo Jackson. Bruh. Oh. <laughs> I got to work on Bo Jackson product times eight. It's Yeah, I was going to say 95 million off the top of my head. It's 97. Close so to 100 it's, million. It's, so for all y'all that complain about how many phone posits were dropping, I did not have anything to do. The weatherman's. <laughs> I did not have anything to do. <laughs> nah, not me. You know, I see on other podcasts, people give everybody else the intros and everything, but I wanted you to introduce yourself how you would like to be. My name is D. Tolliver. I am a uh, product director currently for Cole Haan. Uh, I've been in the sneaker industry for over 15 years. Uh, prior to that, I was a basketball coach uh, in college and in high school. I coached at Oak Hill Academy. Um, the year we had Carmelo Anthony, he was mm -hmm. a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I played at Oak Hill and played in college as well and have just always had a, a love, probably from my time in, uh, as a hooper, a love for for shoes. Shoes were the most important part of the, the equipment. And since I was a, a youngin, I've loved shoes and was have been blessed enough to, you know, spent 16 years working at Nike. And and today, to this very day, I'm still doing what I love to do. Okay, dope. So, you know, this is a sneaker channel, but we're gonna talk about money, entrepreneurship business and definitely sneakers so you gotta we gotta start back from way back though like what even got you into sneakers i like to hear the origin stories because <laughs> everybody's got their different beginnings yeah okay so i have a brother that's 10 years older than me okay uh, my brother was a hooper and uh, i looked up to him because he's my big bro and uh, he was always into um oh man you know he got me into hip-hop first um tape that i bought uh was uh eric b and rakim paid in full okay so like he just had a massive influence on my life and um the things that i developed a passion for and sneakers being one of those and i remember i was this is literally one of my earliest memories i was six years old 1985 so i'm dating myself here Jeez. <laughs> six years old and he got uh the carolina blue Jordan ones. Oh, okay. And I had to have them. Yeah. I had to have some Jordans. Yeah. Uh, and my mom, she took me to, we were living in um, Princeton, West Virginia. So I was born in West Virginia and, and raised in North Carolina for most of my life. But Princeton, West Virginia had a mall called Mercer, Mercer Mall, because it's in Mercer County. <laughs> and they had a Foot Locker there. Okay. And to get to the Foot Locker, you walked over, you know, remember how malls used to have like fountains and stuff? Yeah, them? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had to walk over a fountain and people were like tossing pennies and right. stuff in there. I vividly remember walking over that fountain into the Foot Locker, old school Foot Locker with like the the wood walls and stuff. Right. And we got, uh, she, she got me my pair of Jordans. The kicker is... I was six years old, so they were not Air Jordans. They were Sky Jordans. Oh. And I got the Chicago pair. Yeah. But I remember being a little bit um, a little bit salty because I didn't have Air Jordans like my brother had. He right. had Air Jordans. I had Sky Jordans. The Sky Jordans, of course, had no Air unit in them. Mm -hmm. and, um, but my mom got me that as well as the, the flight suit. Mm -hmm. There was a, like a oh a, you had the whole suit I had the whole get up oh, yo. I had the whole get up okay <laughs> and uh, so she got me that when the Air Jordan two came out of course NJ was hurt most of that year it ended up hitting outlets and she got them for me at a Burlington coat factory really so that was the first Jordan that hit over a hundred okay but it was not over a hundred because I was still a kid size. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't get my first pair of adult size Jordans until the three. Got black cements for Christmas. Like at, if every year for Christmas, I'd ask for like the J's, the J, because the Jordan, the threes. Oh, wow, man. Okay. But that was the first one I got in adult sizes, and there was a difference. So on the three, it has the raised lettering, the Nike Air mm -hmm. on the heel. Mm -hmm. On 
the the kid size, one, if you count the eyelets, there's a different number of eyelets right. on it. Right. But on that back portion, in, in 88 anyways, I can't, you know, I'm not sure about the last time they released them, what the kids look like. Um, but on the back portion, it is a uh, emboss. So right. they basically stamp the leather. Right. I was about to say, that was the leather it. instead yeah, of the plastic piece. And, painted yeah. and didn't have the plastic, yeah. like the TPU. Right. Um, so that, to me, to this day, if anyone ever asks me what the best shoe ever is, I'm going to say Black Cement Air Jordan 3. One, you can wear it with anything. Two, it's the first one I got that was adult size. Yeah. And the way that I would consume those shoes, if you will, when I first got them, they were only for hooping. Mm -hmm. So I would play in, you know, Optimus League or whatever league around at that time that my mm -hmm. mom would put me in. I'd never wear them outside, only on, on the gym floor. Mm -hmm. And then after the game, I would come home with a scrub brush and joy and I would Clean them off. <laughs> clean the bottom of them off. That's so they'd up. be like brand new. And then as soon as the season was over, that became my school shoe. Okay. Okay. And then I would just beat them up. Summertime. Wear them outside. Yeah. Wear them year. till there were literally holes in the bottom of them yeah. until I could get the, the next one. Okay. Okay. So sneaker journey began strong. Early. Like yeah. you was right in the middle of the heat of, you know, the shoe game emerging as a new shoe game because i feel like you know you had to run dmc era and all that stuff mm -hmm. right before that but i remember my brother uh was big into run dmc he had a adidas uh crew neck sweatshirt mm -hmm. and then he had uh the rivalries okay like they came out with the uh, i think it was the rivalry but he was big into that as well um i at that point in time because that was more of a lifestyle piece which i don't even think people were calling it lifestyle at right. that point it's just right. a sneaker it's part of the culture yeah um for me it was about like performance basketball mm. mj was the man he's going to have the best shoe right i'm trying to be like mike right the so commercials I need, I need the best shoe too the gatorade and yeah, spike exactly. lee commercials exactly. alone during that yeah. time is going to have you feeling some uh -huh. type of way okay so sneaker journey is starting off strong you get to at this time you're like playing basketball yeah at the same time so not only is it like i'm a sneakerhead but i'm a hooper Yep. So you're like, I'm trying to go to the league. You're like, Sneaker I'm trying head to go to college. Didn't exist. What's that? The term didn't right, exist, right, though. Right. It's just like, I like shoes. And you did not meet that many people that were as knowledgeable about what was coming out. Um, and the way we found out what was coming out, there were no blogs. Oh, right. Internet this yeah. is pre-internet. Um, the way you found out what was coming out or you know what the new color was was in when MJ would wear it. Mm -hmm. So he'd always just start the season in the white pair, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then you get to the All Star game. Did he bring out the black pair? That's when the black. Yeah. The, when the black Jones <laughs> yeah. were like, yeah. you know, you you could see them for the first time. And um, for me, I always gravitated towards the black shoe mm -hmm. because you keep it cleaner longer. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, and like, I had to stretch my shoes to make them last. It's not like I was getting a pair every week or every month. Right. Like, nah, you're getting maybe two a year. And what size What size shoe were you like around that time? Well, let's see. For the three, uh, which is when I really started playing organized basketball because I was in the third grade. I think I was a size eight at okay. that time. I was okay. a big kid. I'm yeah, six, so, four now. Okay. So, yeah. You know. So as you emerged and you start to realize too, like, because we always shared that commonality of like, we like dark shoes because they don't look as big either. Like yeah, our yeah. foot just is like mm -hmm. size 13. It's like I feel huge. like a clown like, when I'm wearing some white shoes. Yeah. Throw me in some chucks and they look like skis. Right. You no, know, I feel that. I feel that. Okay. So now on the basketball side, on not even like sneaker side, but like, are you like trying to go to the league? Are you trying to get a scholarship well, in college? Everybody, like, everybody that hoops has dreams of going to the league. And I would say that my dream of going to the league continued into probably my freshman year of college. Okay. And then I realized like, yo, I, I'm good enough to get a scholarship. I'm not good <laughs> enough to go to the NBA. Okay. So I need to make the most of this. But my brother being 10 years older than me, he was as much a father figure for me as uh, as a brother mm -hmm. he really put a lot of um effort into my development as mm -hmm. a basketball player so for example when i was in middle school i went to this um middle school called east garner middle school in garner north carolina and my brother got a job 
uh, working for Garner Parks and Recreation Department mm-hmm. so that he would have keys to gyms. We had a hoop in our driveway, right? But there's nothing like hoop. Not like in hooping a gym. in a gym. Yeah. So now we had access to get into, you know, different gyms in the city, mm-hmm. um, and just hoop. And we he would take it'd be a Friday night, and it'd be me and three of my friends. This guy named Tony Blue. Hope you're watching a podcast and Bill Jones. Hope okay. you're watching a podcast. I still talk to them to this day. Okay. Like this, like that's what basketball does for you. You know, from a football standpoint, right? You build. A brotherhood, lifelong relationships, lifelong relationships. Yeah. Yep. So uh, we on a Friday night we'd be in there hooping, and this is before the gun or any of those kind of like tools came out right. where you could go and get five hundred J's up yourself. Right. Now my brother would just be rebounding for us, right. and it's like, yeah, you're gonna get five hundred makes in, and that is how I um, developed a skill set good enough to get a D one scholarship. Okay. It's just work. It's mm-hmm. 10,000 hours principle. Not if you put sure. enough time into any one thing, you're going to get good at it, mm-hmm. you know? So so you're like, I'm going D1. I'm emerging out of high school. What was it? What was like the high? I don't know about the high school version of you. Like, okay, what was, um, what was Young D back in high school? <clears throat> so Young D back in high school was uh, a buck 58, soaking wet. I was skinny. Um, I could jump. Um, uh, my J was wet, but like I was a good student, you know, I, 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 my, my parents ingrained in me like how important school was. So I always like, you know, did my best in school and got great grades. Wasn't ever really in trouble. My brother wouldn't let me be, right, you know, right. he like kept me on the straight and narrow path. Yeah. So I'm, I'm uh, thankful for that. Um, but yeah, I was just like a, a normal kid that loved to hoop and loved shoes and like, I didn't really do much else. Right. I ain't had no girlfriends. Right. You know, come home, do my homework, and then let's hoop. Mm-hmm. That's that was basically like my life. And um, I went to a Catholic school for two years in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, called Cardinal Gibbons High School. And then between my sophomore and junior year, I um, transferred to Oak Hill Academy. Okay. So Oak Hill is like a basketball powerhouse, mm-hmm. right? And our head coach at the time was Coach Smith. He retired, uh, not this past year, not the, the the summer last summer. He retired. Oh, the, when you went to the event. yeah, I went yeah. to the yeah, yeah, went yeah. to his retirement party in Charlotte, yeah. North Carolina. He retired uh, this past summer, but um, they have their pick of who they want to take, mm-hmm. right? So my brother had called up because we had like. A killer AAU team. Our AAU team was like stacked, man. We had um, Brennan Haywood mm-hmm. played for us, big seven footer mm-hmm. that you know spent some years in the league. Um, we had a guy named Irvin Murray who played for Wake Forest. We had Craig Dawson, who's Jerry Stackhouse's nephew. He's the head coach now at Woodbury Forest High okay. School. Um, we had Julius Peppers. Okay. So the defensive yeah, end, yeah. Julius <laughs> Savage. No, for like, real. He was he was built like that at 16 years old. That's crazy. You know? So anyways, we had a great team. Um, and Coach Smith was coming down to the Bob Gibbons tournament. There's a Bob Gibbons tournament that happened every Memorial Day. And they mm-hmm. would hold it at Duke University, North Carolina State, and UNC. That's where the games would be. Coach Smith comes to watch one of my games. I have nine three-pointers in the first half. Oh, shoot. 27. He's like, ready to Like, up. yo, <laughs> about to get that scholarship. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Coach Smith leaves at halftime. You know how many points I scored the rest of the game? Nothing. Zero. Right. <laughs> right. But, but the damage was already done. Already you know done. what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, then I went up to have a workout at Oak Hill to, like, look at the school, and he worked me out. And, you know, I was literally raining threes from all over the gym. Mm-hmm. And that's how I got to go to Oak Hill. So you still got the strap this day or what? It's always stays oh, wet. It don't matter. Ready? We go out there in your driveway. I'll show you. Um, so my junior year, we had um, Steven Jackson. Okay. That's my guy. Yeah. You know, Steve was a senior from Port Arthur, Texas. Um, we had, man, people that I don't name are probably going to be mad at me. We had seven or eight guys go D1. We had a guy named Ricardo Crumble. AKA Tree, he was 6'7 from um, Cleveland, Ohio. 
we had Attila Cosby. What a name, right? Right. Attila. Right. He was a stone cold killer on the court too. He was about six, six nine, six ten, from the DC area. He ended up going to um, Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, ended up later transferring to George Washington. At point guard, we had a guy named Ed Sheffy, RIP. Ed went to Georgetown. Uh, he was like, this was a, a an awakening for me because up to that point, I had not played with talent like this every right. single day. Every day. Yeah. And right. Ed, coming from D.C., he had, man, he was doing like the sham god type stuff before people was calling it a sham god, right. you right. know. He had amazing, amazing handles. He was our point guard. Um, we had, um, oh man, I'm I'm forgetting now. But we had we had a stack squad. Uh, one of my best friends, Brett Carey, he's coaching at, uh, I believe he's at Indiana State right now, or he, uh, I think that's where. I actually, might have gone to Austin P. After that, college coaching, which we'll get into, mm -hmm. is uh, interesting because there's. Um, very little job stability, and you're always moving like every no, two to three years. Real. So it just for depends real. on like what do you value in life. If you mm -hmm. value stability, probably not the the role. Not everybody's going to be like Tom Izzo and be at Michigan State for thirty years. Locked in, you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah, it it just don't like happen that. like that. It There's a handful like of them, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my senior year at Oak Hill was um, we had Will Avery, who's now coaching at Duke. He was in the league for a little bit. We had uh, another guard named uh, Jermaine Medley who played at uh, at Villanova. We had a, a big, tall cat from 6'11 from um, Senegal. His name was uh, Jules Kamara. He ended up going to Kentucky. Um, man, we just had we we had stack squads mm -hmm. and uh, lots of lots and lots of um, exposure to college coaches coming through. Yeah, and then that's kind of how I ended up at UNC Charlotte. Uh, on a basketball scholarship. Uh, UNC Charlotte was in um, Conference USA at the time. There still is a Conference USA, but like this is before all the conference realignment stuff happened right. with football in right. uh, uh, mid 2000s. Okay. So Conference USA had Cincinnati when Bob Huggins was there mm -hmm. and the Jordan. Jordan game on point. Yo, for real. You know what I'm saying? They need to bring that back. I, I think they're they they were Audi for a while. I think they're back to being a Jordan school. But they don't get nothing cool. Well, I don't think they're winning ball games like that. Either. Man, when they had Huggins, I just remember because when I was younger, like seeing that come like early two thousands, mm -hmm. like it was so fire. Like because they, they had the C like logo of, on the butt. Yeah, remember? like they were the first people to do. I'm trying to think like they might have been one of the first ones that I remember back in the day. Them, North Carolina A and T. Yeah. And St. John's. Yep. I think those were the first yeah. three Jordan schools. And maybe Cal. Cal might have been the fourth. Okay. But they had the fire gear, mm -hmm. you know? No, for real. I remember um, that. But yeah, Conference USA, we had Cincinnati. We had Louisville. So Denny Crum was still coaching there. And then Rick Patino would later come. Mm -hmm. uh, DePaul was in the conference. Uh, Marquette. Oh, okay. Um, I'm probably forgetting. Like, it was a big... They called it Conference USA because we had like 16 teams in 16 Sheesh. different states. Sheesh. So you'd always, you know, have to travel UAB... Um, South Florida, uh, but really the big ones were uh, Cincinnati, Marquette, Louisville, DePaul. But we had our own. Mm -hmm. Out of my four years there, we went to the tourney three times. We uh, won the conference championship, the conference tournament twice. Okay. My sophomore year, we were a five seed, and they always predict the five twelve upset. Mm -hmm. We were playing Rhode Island mm -hmm. and Lamar Odom. So Lamar Odom was playing for Rhode Island, and um, Everyone was picking them to upset us that game. Um, we got we won that game, and actually our um, our small forward Galen Young, who passed away tragically uh, two summers ago, he was strapping. You mm -hmm. know, like shut him down not for the game, but he shut him down when it counted. Right, right. You know, right when, when, you when need the it. game was yeah, tight. Yeah. Um, and then we played Oklahoma to get to the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, they had just beat Arizona, who had Jason Terry. Mm -hmm. Arizona was a four seed. Oklahoma was a 13. Man. They had, they had Eduardo Nahara. It's crazy hearing him. these names because it's like flashing me. Like, obviously, you know, we're years apart, but it's crazy because I remember hearing all this stuff and seeing this stuff on TV. Like you would growing up. Because yeah, we're, you know, I was growing up watching all mm -hmm, that stuff. Like, mm -hmm. um, So they beat Arizona, and we went into a 12-13 game to get to the Sweet 16. Uh, our starting center... Uh, Kelvin Price, who ended up becoming a professional boxer, man, 
Like you talk about a dude that's a savage. Like I've never met an athlete like this. He could, he could have gone and walked on for the track team at Charlotte and probably been the triple jump holder, record holder. That's crazy. Like without ever practicing. Anyways, Everybody got somebody like that on their mm-hmm. team. And, um, you know, we're talking six, eight, 235 pounds, nothing but muscle. Uh, and mean too. Mm-hmm. He had a mean streak in him. <laughs> so that's what you want from a big man. Anyways, he had food poisoning. Sheesh. He was in the locker room on an IV before the game. And um, that was game over because Nahara, he had 27 and 15 against us. And well, I want to say we lost by about seven, but that was the closest we ever got to getting to the Sweet 16. Other than that, we were always making it to the second round. Okay. 32. Okay. But man, good experience. I got my school paid for. Hell yeah. Um, I got a free education out of that, uh, and I made relationships lifelong. I, sure. KP, Calvin Price, I still talk to him to this day. Uh, my college coach, matter of fact, is getting inducted into the Charlotte Hall of Fame on September 15th, and I'm trying to, uh, you know, I'm out here in Portland, but trying to get a trip out there. Gotta pull up. <laughs> yeah, so I can see, because <laughs> yeah. like, that's my that's my man yeah. right there, you know? Um, but I'm thankful for those opportunities, made me who I am. You know, I wasn't a star, but I I grinded. I earned my spot there. Uh, and I think, like, all of my teammates would say, like, they valued my friendship and they valued me as, like, an important member of the team. Because mm-hmm. whether you are the, the star or you're the last player off the bench, you can push people and make oh, your sure. other teammates better. For sure. You know? For sure. I know somebody, people see that a lot, too. Like, they got to be the center of attention and stuff. And it's like, you don't always have to be the center of attention. Like you can still do your thing, put in your work, and still have a huge impact for everybody else's success. Got to be able to lead. Time. Sometimes you got to step back, follow a little and bit no, too. Yeah. You know, you know, they say know your role, but like yeah. it's sometimes like that role is more important than trying to do something else. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay, so you get through that, you get through college, and how do you end up in Portland? Ah, so well, when I first uh, graduated from school, I went back and coached at Oak Hill. Okay, for a year. So I was the dorm parent because Oak Hill is a boarding school in southwestern Virginia. Mm-hmm. And the town doesn't have a stoplight. And I call it a town because it's not really a town. <laughs> it's not even that. I mean, it is in the sticks, man. That's crazy. So most of your players that are coming there, they may have never seen a cow before they drive down <laughs> to right. Oak Hill. And then all you're seeing is cows and goats and farms and like no stop, no stop stoplights um the school itself is grades 8 through 12 and there's about 130 135 kids it's a baptist boarding school you go to church on sunday you go to school on saturday Mm -hmm. and the basketball team lives in a separate dormitory because Mm -hmm. they travel so they so as they don't disrupt the rest of the students with coming back from games late they put them in a separate dorm so when i went there and coached uh that was the year we had carmelo we had another um great point guard named Justin Gray, who is now the head coach at Western Carolina University. Wait, hold on. Sorry. The era of Carmelo. So you watched Carmelo play LeBron. I was on the sideline that game. I got great stories about that game, too. Just give me a quick snippet. Right, so cause that's, that's, I remember watching it on TV, and I was like, this is crazy as a so kid. So we played them uh, in Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. At the primetime shootout. It was a, is a, a not really a tournament. It's just like a, a two-day event. Uh, sponsored by Adidas. Uh, and there were about 17,000 people in the stands. This is for a high school game. I remember. So LeBron is a junior. Melo's a senior. Mm-hmm. To get to Trenton, we flew into Philly. That same weekend, it was the All-Star game. NBA All-Star game. Okay. It was being held in Philly. Okay. We get off the plane. Who's in the airport getting their bags from baggage claim? Jamie Foxx. <laughs> so it's like people were, our team was like wilding out like yo that's Jamie Foxx right. you know having a conversation with him and stuff and that next day we play them um, and LeBron had on the American flag Kobe's yep yep so I was gonna say that's when he was rocking the Adidas back there rumor has it I, I've never worked at Adidas, so I can't confirm this, but rumor has it there are only three pairs of those shoes that exist. One that was given by Kobe okay. to LeBron. Okay. Two, Kobe wore in the All-Star game. Three, 
uh, Adi's pair, like their whatever they have in their, in their ar- archives. archive or whatever they right? call it. Yeah. So he's wearing those right off rip, which is like, yo, those are crazy. Um, and I remember at the there was a the there was a a foul, and somebody shouts from the stand stands like, hey yo, where'd you get those shoes, LeBron? <laughs> And LeBron was like, Kobe gave them to me. And Mello was a clown, yo. Mello was a clown. He's like, yeah, but um, oh, who's my guy that was at uh, Finley from uh, the Mavericks? He's yeah. like, yeah, but Finley gave me mine because we were at Jordan school. <laughs> Michael Finley ain't giving those shoes, but Mello was a clown. But anyways, they had, um, I think Mello outscored him. It's like 36 to 35. Okay. Uh, but LeBron was really a stat stuffer. And up to that point, Mello was the best high school player I had ever seen. And then when I saw LeBron a year younger, I was like, yo, this. And coach had been trying to tell me because they played him when he was a sophomore and he had like 42 against him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, he's the truth. I remember. So we, we, we had on that team, maybe nine guys go D1. Mm-hmm. One, like the seventh man. Literally was a player of the year for the Southern Conference. That's when you know you got a squad. Super stacked. Right. Uh, our two guard was Eric Wilkins. His brother uh, played for the Miami Hurricanes, Ed Wilkins. He mm-hmm. was like a defensive lineman, I think. Anyways, we were stacked. We had a dude, um, Sonny Ibrahim. He's a Nigerian. Don't check his birth certificate because he might have been 35 at the time. I don't know. <laughs> but like my man was 6'11 and he had elbows sharp as razor blades, Jeez. you know? So we were stacked. And LeBron, they had a, a cat named Romeo Travis, who I want to say, I don't know where, I can't remember where he went. Maybe it was like Toledo or somewhere like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a few cats that could hoop, but nothing to the Not depth the same type of that we had. Yeah. LeBron single-handedly kept them in the game. And then the next year, once Melo was gone, they beat the crap out of Kill on ESPN, like by 20 plus. But anyways, I remember LeBron coming off of a pick and roll at the top of the key. And we doubled him. So we had Melo was guarding uh, um, LeBron. And then Sonny was guarding Romeo Travis, Mm -hmm. who then like – you're going to double on any ball screen. They they had a great double team where LeBron couldn't split it. And LeBron whipped one behind his back that split Sonny and Carmelo's legs. And the pass was so good that Romeo Travis, like, bobbled the ball. Like, you couldn't even expect the, the pass right. to come through. And then he missed the layup. And I was so impressed because LeBron didn't get mad. He tapped his chest it's like it's all right dog you get the next one right i was like yo that's like that's a lot of maturity and he's for like 17, a 16 17, 17 year old kid yeah. you know but yeah that was uh an incredible moment to be a part of Melo had his yellow headband with oak hill oh my gosh um he had the fro because like our school wouldn't let them have braids i remember at the time, yes you know yeah um and yeah, man, it was like that was a special moment to be on the sidelines for. I remember LeBron having a breakaway and Eric Wilkins literally grabbing his arm and LeBron just taking him up with him. And it was an and one. And like he was so strong. He literally just took <laughs> took somebody up with him. And That's not a wild. small person, by the way. You right. Know? Right. So Oak Hill is crazy fun experience, couple years. And then then I went back to Charlotte okay. as a director of basketball operations. Okay. And which basically means, you know, I was helping uh, uh, with scouting. I was helping with recruitment. uh, And then I did a lot of the logistical stuff. So if you travel Mm -hmm. to an away game at Cincinnati, you're going to need flights. Flights, hotels. You're going to need a bus. Today's partner is ShopDNAShow.com. Are you tired of wearing low quality gear? I completely understand. I made a personal mission to go out and find higher quality stuff, and give it to you guys at an affordable price. And not only because of that, I have to wear this stuff every day. And I don't want to be wearing cheap clothing all the time. So I want to make sure that you guys know about it and are understanding that we have a lot of cool stuff coming out as well. Hit the link down below or pinned or wherever it may be. It's going to be shopdnashow.com. There's new drops every single month. I'm excited to see you guys in the gear. And now let's go ahead and get back to the podcast. I just kind of decided that... um I did not want to stay in college basketball anymore. It's such a grind 
the business aspect of it and the uncertainty of like, yo, couple losing seasons, you out yeah. of work, you're looking for a job, you know? So, um, I knew that I was really passionate about shoes mm-hmm. and I made one phone call. So when I was at Oak Hill, we were sponsored by Jordan. We were the very first high school sponsored by Jordan. That was my senior year in co- in high school. That's what I was going to say. You right? had that, that Jordan tie already yep. to the industry. Um, so this guy that still works at Nike, he's the head of grassroots basketball, Tony Dorado. Um, big shout out to Tony. If it wasn't for him, I never would have probably realize these hopes and dreams like you got to grind but it also takes people to help you along the way and help open some doors so i called him said well let me back up a little bit the whole thing that planted the seed there i always liked shoes but i never thought about where they were made Mm. or how they were made Mm. so when we had carmelo at oak hill we played in the les schwab invitational here it's a big christmas tournament every year back then 2001 it was held at memorial coliseum Mm -hmm. now it's out at uh, liberty high school in hillsborough so one of the days that we're here we got to tour nike campus Mm -hmm. yep and our nike rep at the time was a, a guy named keith brown Keith Brown walks us around. We had first we had practice in the Bo Jackson. Yeah. Which was yeah. like, yo, this is tight. Bo yeah, is my so <laughs> Bo was my guy growing up, yeah, man. You yeah, know? Yeah. Like Bo was Bo was as influential for me as Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. Once in a generation athlete. Th- that's that was a when it comes to sports, like for me, I'm like, I feel like I grew up in the best era, but I feel like the people that were born just a little bit before me truly grew up in the best era of like seeing sports. Cause like, yeah, I can remember all that stuff, but I didn't get to fully experience it. Cause I was born in the early nineties, but like the people that was born in like in the early eighties and stuff like that, those are the people that got to enjoy and truly cherish those moments of Bo Jackson, King Griffey, you name it, all the different guys. So I'm sure your yeah. memories are. I have many, many childhood heroes. Bo's right up there at the top, along with MJ. Uh, so we practice in the Bo. Um, and then we got our tour around campus. This is 2001, mind you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And getting ready to turn 2002. We were here right before the new year. So like campus was like half the size. So we a had a focus group. Size. We had a focus group in the Mia Ham building on the second floor right outside the Tar Hill Cafe. Okay, okay. The dude conducting the focus group was Gentry Humphrey. Okay. G Money. This is crazy. Okay. So G Money, who would later become my boss and like a major, major mentor to me and just uh, one of the most amazing human beings you'll ever meet. Mm-hmm. G Money is pulling Jay's out of a out of a duffel bag like Santa Claus. Yes. And I'm basically, I'm 25 and he's here talking to the 17 year old kids on our team and I'm elbowing cast to get out the way. <laughs> like, yo, what you got next? I need to see what's next, you know? And um, that moment was just like, wow, mm-hmm. that's somebody's job. They yeah. gets to do that. Yeah. And then we go for a walk around campus and we bump into this guy named Tinker Hatfield. Okay. Nobody on the team knows who he is, but because I'm so into this, like, this culture, right. I knew who the cat was. Right. All I could do was stare at his shoes. Mm-hmm. Yo, what are those? Mm-hmm. He got some tennis ball joints on, right? Mm-hmm. All tennis ball colored, like the felt from a tennis ball. Mm-hmm. And he got these crazy cuts in the side of them. Nike free. It's a prototype. I didn't put two and two together until three years later, That's my man. That's crazy. So when he leaves, I'm I'm dumbstruck and I can't even like get out a sentence to like introduce myself mm-hmm. or anything. I'm just mm-hmm. like staring the whole time. When we walk, when he walks away from us because we stopped and he had a little conversation with the, the group, I asked Keith, KB, I'm like, yo, KB, what, what were those? I don't know, probably some prototypes. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and then that That's shoe came be. out. I want to say the free came out in 04 or 05, mm-hmm. right around that time. When I saw it, I was like, yo, that's what he was wearing. Right. And I was working in Nike retail by then. Okay. But like, so, 
Yeah, so, so like that's okay. what's planted the seed to come work. For that's Nike. what that's what made you be like when you got that experience on campus. Yep, because this is the experience that a lot of people don't get to get. Mm-hmm. It's the experience that there's levels to the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of different rooms that you'll never get to go into. Mm-hmm. A lot of different uh, accesses and all the different. Even things. the employee store can make you want to come work right. for the brand out right. here. You know what I'm for saying? Sure. It's like going into a Walmart stocked with Nike. For sure. You know. For sure. So you you saw this you got you got a small glimpse a of taste. the experience a taste and then what made you be like yo I'm moving out here so that was whenever I made the decision like mm, I don't think I want to keep coaching but I want to be involved in sports somehow mm-hmm. and I know that I want to do something that um, I'm passionate about so my pops was a coal miner and then he worked on oil rigs mm-hmm. as an electrician and then he worked in um, rock quarries okay. He did that for 30, 40 years. And I just remember how hard he worked. And he worked because he loved his family and he wanted to provide for us. But I also know that he didn't love his job. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, right. my pops would come home tired, mm-hmm. dirty. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was not something that he found joy in. He found joy in being able to support his family, but he did not find joy in the action of, you know, his actual work. So, uh, that planted a seed in my mind of like, man, I'm going to have to work for the rest of my life. I may as well find something that I love to do. Mm-hmm. If I can if I can find something that I'm passionate about, it'll feel less like work and more like a hobby. So, to me, footwear was that um, thing that I've always been passionate about that I felt like I could find joy in that because – you know, seeing Gentry, seeing Tinker, what they were working on, what they did, seeing the Nike campus and how folks were like, you know, conducting themselves on the day to day there. That was just, it felt like Xanadu, mm-hmm. like some far off world that like, I just need to get a piece of it. It's so weird how like you drive past those gates or mm-hmm. the little Nike switches on that bar. And it's just like, it feels like you're yeah entering a whole new world. And like, it's like. I don't know. It's so hard to explain, but I know what until you mean, you've been there, you yeah. can't really explain it. You have to experience it. Yeah. But then once you get on campus, anytime I'd have friends like come visit, and I'd give them a tour of campus, they were they were in awe mm-hmm. of like everything that's there, you mm-hmm. know, and what built that place up. Right. So okay. So now walk me through the process financially. Oh, where are you at? Bruh. What's going on? Like I found an apartment. Like how did it go to okay, literally so, packing your bags and getting out here? Um. Uh, Financially, I was not in a great place because, you know, as a Dobo, director of basketball op, I was probably making like a little over 40. Okay. You know, it's good money for 2003 or four, but not great money. Mm -hmm. I go into my coach and I tell him I'm going to go work for Nike. Mm -hmm. I don't even have a job yet though, DJ. Right. I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Here's my two weeks notice. I went on a preseason trip with them. I helped um, book everything for a trip to Toronto. And we played like a little international tour or whatever. And then after that was done, I was done. But I still had to make some bread because I ain't even have a Nike job, fam. I just had a dream. So I started working at UPS. Out there? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Um, Loading and unloading tractor trailers. Okay. Night shift because they paid more. Uh, I was making probably eleven, twelve dollars an hour, something okay. like that, just to like pay, pay rent and eat. Yeah. And I had called Tony Dorado up. Okay. What do I got to do to get out there? Tony said, "Take any Nike job you can get, because more often than not, the brand is going to hire from within the company and outside." Now, that right. may have changed today, but back then, this was this was yeah, the, the reality. Yeah. Yeah. So I, we had a Nike factory store in Concord Mills, which is a big mall in Concord, North Carolina, right by the Lowe's Motor Speedway. Mm-hmm. Shout out store 175. <laughs> I got my first job was a part-time sales associate seasonal. Jeez. Seasonal, which means they're not going to extend you once Christmas is over. All right. You're like, I got a few months of this. Yes. And that's it. And I started in November. Um, I cannot remember the actual date. I want to say November 16th, 2004, a few 
maybe a week before Black Friday. But the reason I remember so vividly the time was on my third day of work, working in retail as a part-time sales associate, back in footwear, making sure the stacks are all nice in the bins and stuff. I come home, I turn on the TV, and I sit on the couch, and it is the Pistons playing the Indiana Pacers Mm -hmm. in an event that would become known as the Malice at the Palace. Yeah. And right when I turn the TV on, Ron Artest shoves, or he hacks Ben Wallace. Mm -hmm. Hacked him. Ben Wallace shoves him in the neck. Artest walks over to the scores table, lays down, and I'm just watching like, yo, what is this dude doing? Next thing you know, a beer comes from the stands. Oh, yep. Artest jumps up in there, and then who else? Steven Jackson. Hmm. Steven Jackson runs up in the stands because uh, he was with the Pacers at the time. Mm-hmm. And that that team very well may have won like the, the world title that year, uh, but it ended up they didn't because those two guys got um, – Suspended for right. the rest of the year. Right. But like that was weird just because like Steve was my guy from Oak Hill. I just started Nike. And um, man, I just grinded in retail. Uh, so I went from a part-time sales associate to eventually they had a lead position open up, which okay. is like entry-level management. So so you were there and there was no off time. You just ended up... Just hustling. Okay. Worked no off time. I I remember the la- the day I quit from UPS is I had to unload a 52 foot trailer full of um, tires that were shrink wrapped together. Oh my gosh! They were shrink wrapped together and they had the rims in them. Yo, man, too much. my back! I felt like an 87 year old man yeah, after that day. And then I thought I was done. And then the trailer had a false bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to open up the false bottom and like unload more. That's when I walked out. I was like, I I'm not cut out for that life right. for sure. Um, luckily. I had already had the interview with Nike. They hired me. And then I just grinded and worked hard every single day. I showed up on time. I went above and beyond. And eventually they had a uh, management position open. When, I remember when I went in for my interview as a part-time sales associate, I told them my goal is to go work at Nike mm-hmm. World Headquarters in mm-hmm. Beaverton. So how, I always wondered that too, because I, you know, I talked to a lot of people about working at outlets and stuff here. Um, but not as many people that work at outlets in different states, mm-hmm. especially because, you know, it's kind of like a part of the process here. Like, oh, I'm going to work at outlet, then I'm going to yep. go to Nike Town, then I'm going to work on campus, I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of like a part of the funnel, yep. right? It's like grade school, middle school, high school. That's kind of like a part of the thing here. But never from somebody who's that far. So how do people react to you when you're like, I'm about to go work at Nike? You know what I'm saying? Um, I had good managers that were supportive of um, my dream, mm-hmm. if you will. The problem is, is proximity. Mm -hmm. You're 3,000 miles away and they don't really know people on campus and the functions that I want to be. But there is retail operations on campus. And since then, um, there is like a retail program that brings talented individuals from retail onto world headquarters in, in different roles. Now? Yeah. Okay. So if you can like, if you can show out at your job and do a great job, and you get the support of your manager, it's possible to come out here. Mm -hmm. Um, That program didn't necessarily exist when I first started. It was right about the time that I actually got out here. But all I did was just let my, I declared it. You know what I'm saying? Like Mm -hmm. in order for me to achieve the goal, I had to, um, I had to make that my intention Mm -hmm. that I was going to get out here. And so I ended up um, applying for, well over 70 jobs at world headquarters okay. while I was working in retail. Okay. A few of those I would get interviews for. Tony Dorado, bless his heart, bless his soul, he um he got me an interview for a sports marketing position. Okay. So I had a great interview. There was a uh young lady that was an HR representative at the time. Her name was Janelle Neva. She's now Janelle Ocker. Um She's vice president for another company, but uh, I impressed her with my passion. Mm -hmm. And she said, hey, whatever happens with this job, we need people with your passion out here. Right. So if there's any, if this doesn't work out, if another one does, if if there's anything you see, let me know. So I did not get that job with Tony, but now I had an additional ally right. at World Headquarters. Right. So then every time I'd apply, I'd say, hey, I just applied for this job. 
can you put me in contact with the hiring manager, any of that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. you know? I ended up going from the Charlotte or Concord Mills factory store. I moved down to Char- uh, Charleston, South Carolina okay, to take another role with the store, like an elevated role. Mm-hmm. I was a uh, shipping and receiving manager. Okay. Um, and the whole time I'm still applying for stuff. Um, and I had a great manager there who was really supportive of, of me and what my dream was. And uh, eventually I was able to get an interview for um, a contact center service rep. What is that? It's you work at a call center. Okay. So for if Nike? you call, yeah, if you call Nike.com, mm-hmm. if you uh, are, if let's say you have a golf club and the shaft broke mm-hmm. or the head flew off. So Nike golf, Nike timing. We used to make watches. Yep. Nike vision, mm-hmm. sunglasses. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Nike.com. So we did phone calls, live chat, and email. This is like at the beginning of this era of stuff. Too. Yes. So this is when like blogs were coming about. This is like pe- when Nike Talk and Soul Collector yes. was getting established. And then like 13-year-old kids would hit you at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday asking about like a launch date. Yep. And most of the people in my department were not as uh, avidly into, you know, sneakers as I was. Right. I distinctly remember getting this one email from this guy who was describing a shoe. And if there was a hard email that people couldn't answer, they would like come to me. Like, what is this guy talking about? He was talking about a shoe that was green and there were tiger stripes on it. And, yo, he's talking about the carnivore. Right. This is before the carnivore came back. Right. You know? Right. But I knew he's talking about the carnivore. One of the awesome things about that job is we had access to all the uh, the um, catalogs. Okay. So even if I were on a lunch break, I could just go and look at catalogs, just which learning. is cool in itself yeah. to see, you know, all the old stuff that that Nike has done. Um, so that was my first job on campus, and uh, then that was 2008 that I moved out here, and then there was um, a Nike had layoffs mm-hmm. uh, in right around 2009. Economy was not in a great place there. I was fortunate enough to make it through the round of layoffs. Mm-hmm. And then they put me in charge of social media as mm-hmm. a social media um, specialist. Mm-hmm. So I was the first one for Nike store. So if there was like a tweet to Nike store, it, that Twitter would be me replying. Twitter was huge during that yes, time. That was like when Twitter was blowing up. Yes. You know? Like that was like, everybody was going to Twitter for the releases, to the store information, all yep. the stuff. The stores was tweeting out. That's crazy. So the cool part about that job is I work Sunday through Thursday. Okay. So then Fridays, I had time to network. People mm-hmm. talk to you about networking. I actually don't love the term networking because it implies like a transaction and I'm not really a transactional individual. I try to build relationships. Um, so on Fridays, I would come to campus on my day off and I'd try to have lunch with people. And one of those days, I would meet with Tony Dorado. I've mentioned his name a couple times before. Tony told me, hey man, the way you talk about product, you'd probably be a great product line manager. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, cool, what's that? Right. I don't know, you know? So he starts connecting me with people. He connects me with some developers. He connects me with some um, product line management people. One of those individuals he referred me to was Gentry Humphrey. So I get on Gentry's calendar. Super busy man for him to find. He would always find time to at least have 30 minutes. Even whenever I was working for him, I remember distinctly like all kinds of young cats coming through. And he would give them guidance, you know, and meet with them. I was one of those people back in 2009. And um, we sat down for a 30-minute meeting, and we ended up going 45. And when I walked in there, I was like, yo, you did a focus group eight years. or right. you, This was eight years. Right. You did a focus group eight years ago for me. And to think at the time, he was like the general manager of international for Jordan brand. So Jordan was getting heavy into like starting to do stuff in Europe. They had not really done a ton up to that point. It was primarily like, you know, uh, North America, if you will. And we just hit it off. Uh, I clearly thought he was an amazing person. And I think he um, saw something in me too. And he told me, um, yeah, man, don't be a stranger. Like, hit me up, but don't blow me up. You know? I went back to my desk and I set a reminder in my calendar to hit him up at least once a quarter. So it pop up, yo, hit Gentry up. Sometimes I see him in a gym, have a conversation, very informal. Um, 
But then when that reminder would pop up, I'd be like, yo, what's good? I just got the green bean fives. Those are, uh, those are sick. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, wh- what are you into? Yeah. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. And we just did that. And I was investing like time into building a relationship with this man. My first product role came not long after that. I was trying to get into footwear, but f- footwear's um, very competitive to get into, especially if you don't have experience. Um, and I was able to get a role called a, um, it was called a CIA, Category Information Analyst, mm-hmm. in apparel. So we do systems maintenance and we're uh, stewards of data integrity, if you will. So like when you're building product that has to have a style number, has to have a color code, all the kind of stuff that like generates a UPC symbol for or UPC code for when you go to retail. But like what it does is it helps keep the line organized so that your product line managers like are able to, you know, do their job. And um, I got put in sportswear for that, okay. which was like, that was when, when it was NSW, this M65 jackets, phone posit was, was about to get cranking. So I was that, like, thankful to be into sportswear because sportswear was, um, if I had to work on, I wanted to work on footwear, I didn't get that chance. So they put me in apparel. That's the best place they could have put me. And then I got, I got to working with like a great group of individuals that were really talented. One in particular, um, he uh, is a, I believe he's a senior director in Jordan Apparel right now, Brew McHale. So Brew McHale is one of the co-founders of PNB, Post No Bills. It's okay. so like, it's a streetwear brand yeah. from New York. Um, Brew was a graffiti writer. Like he's an incredible individual, super talented. He's been around. He knows like everybody super connected. So I got a chance to learn under him how to manage product. Mm-hmm. And he made dope product. This was, um, Brew was in charge of Amplify Basketball. So like okay. sportswear basketball stuff. So when they would do a Kobe Bryant destroyer, mm-hmm. um, that was him. And Brew, I, I got to watch how he made decisions. I got to watch the input that he would have in the process as a uh, product line manager and it helped me understand, like, because I, I don't have a business degree, man. Mm-hmm. My degree's in history. I tell stories. Right, right. You know? Right. But, like, at the end of the day, if you can tell a story on a product, yeah. then... And that's, like, Nike's backbone. That's what Nike does. They tell yeah. stories. And you engage the consumer, and you create an emotional connection with the brand. But by watching him, I was able to realize, hey, I have the capacity and ability to do this. Not to say what he's doing is easy, but it's like, I understand what he's doing and I understand the decisions that he's making. And that to me gave me the confidence that like, okay, I belong here. We were making, uh, this was when Manny Pacquiao was with the brand and we were making a Manny Pacquiao destroyer. All right. And this was when Manny Pacquiao, Pac-Man was, he was it. This is before he fought Floyd, you know, and this destroyer had everything on it. Like I'm talking golden gloves patches the the land of the rising sun like um the the eight pointed sun mm-hmm. i think it's the eight pointed sun like the the filipino flag it was an incredible piece with so much ornate embroidery and embellishment on it they needed to hit a price point so every time you add a new piece of embellishment on a product the cost to make that product goes up and i remember being distraught that we were having to spec this thing and take so much embroidery and embellishment off of it so that it did it did not it was not a um it was not a a a wool leather sleeve destroyer this was a nylon destroyer Mm. so you're trying to hit a price point to sell more units Mm -hmm. you do a 600 hundred dollar jacket how many how many of those are you going to sell versus a 120 dollar jacket you're going to sell a lot more now you still want to hit high margins because Nike and all these other companies are in the pro, uh, are in the business of they're in a business. You know, you got to make money. But I remember seeing so much stuff taken off of that jacket. Me as a fan, one, I love boxing. Pacquiao, I loved Pacquiao. Remember when he put a hurt on Ricky Hatton. But like, I loved Pacquiao. I wanted that jacket in its um, original form for myself, right? right. And I was just seeing it's never going to happen. One, because I'm 6'4 and the sample size is a medium. Mm-hmm. 
So like I can't get the sample. Not option. Not yeah. Right. I need y'all to come out with it at retail so I can get the XL. Right. You know. Fast forward to like a year later because I was in apparel for about eighteen months. Fast forward to a year later, and my college comes out here to play um, Oregon State. Okay. And I remember like uh, going to that game because I got tickets from the the trainer guy named uh, Carlton Anderson C Murder we used to call him. So. Uh, Carlton gives me tickets. I'm waiting at the wheel call to get my tickets. And I'm standing behind AC Green. Mm. And I was like, yo, it's AC. Let me get a locket of your hair, yo. You know? (laughs) But anyways, AC, uh, that was just like something cool that night. But I had that destroyer on. Because it had come out at the employee store. I got it. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm I'm rolling into the, uh, I had that on. And do you remember the Zoom trainer Hirachis? There was like a green uh, lantern colorway. I had those on because my school was green. green Yeah. 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 I felt fresh. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to this game just knowing (laughs) I'm killing them, dog, you know? And uh, Carlton, he looked like, I I called him C-Murder, but he looked like Roy Jones Jr., but a, like a miniature version of him. So we called him Boy Jones Jr. We, you know you know how like team, teams are. You you Joan on each other, you know, and just have fun. But he loves boxing. Okay. So we would always go to fights and stuff when I was working there with him, you know. Um, and he sees the jacket and goes nuts. Right. He's like, yo, this jacket's so amazing. Like I ended up having to go back to the store and buy one and then sent it to him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That taught me the lesson that before the consumer sees it, they never know what's going into that product. And you don't necessarily, you have to really be an expert on what the consumer is going to value Mm -hmm. in their product. Mm -hmm. So when you are in product line management and you're working with designers and you're working with developers, you have to make decisions based on uh, where is the consumer going to find the most value. And that's what you put your money into. If it's something they're not going to find value in, that's where you can strip away. That's where you can, you know, take. Yes, yes. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I had a quick question. Are you guys interested in taking your shoe game to another level, but you just don't know where to start? I built a full program just for somebody like you, the Six Figure Sneakerhead. It's an eight week program that takes you through all the steps that you need to know. We have a full community where you can engage with everybody else that's going through the same program as you. We have monthly live meetups where you can connect with me and other members on the inside, and we set goals for each other and hold each other accountable. Also, we give away a free pair of shoes every single month with different challenges. If this is something that's for you or you're looking to take your game to the next level or even flip your sneakers to turn that into real estate, this is the place where you need to be. I can help you with finding loans and remodeling properties and getting yourself on the right path to become a millionaire if that's something that you desire. If this sounds like something for you, hit the link down below in the description and get signed up today. This is more than just sneakers. I wanna see people grow and succeed in all aspects of life. Let's get back to the podcast. You have the sneaker critics, the clothing critics, the consumers, right? Mm -hmm. That are always criticizing you guys' work at the same time. And you guys have to make the best decision for the company, for Mm -hmm. the lively sake of your job, all these different things. And yeah, you're not going to make something that everybody loves, but then you got to still kind of shape and mold the culture at the Mm -hmm. same time. So it's kind of like a lot on your plate when it comes to doing something like that. It's easy to criticize. It's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. And... um. If you want to work in product, whether that be product line management, Mm -hmm. if you want to work in design, you have to have a thick skin because everyone's going to have an opinion. So that means you have to have confidence in yourself, your abilities. Um, And you know what? You don't hit a thousand. Mm -hmm. You're never going to, as many cool shoes as I have under my belt Mm -hmm. that I've worked on, I have... Probably that many duds right, as right, well. Right. Probably more. Straight to the outlets. It's funny, like, we'll come in and be like, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And I'm like, these are trash. Those are going to outlet this way. And then you'll be like, I know. And then you still got to release it. Yeah. And that's, well, the, that's the part that we talk about before. And this is the part that a lot of sneakerheads are not going to realize. But sometimes it's out of your control, too. And you got to drop those weak shoes, those weak clothes. So I don't think it's anybody's intention to drop a weak shoe. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think everyone goes in it with the best intentions of like, let's put the best product out that we can. Mm -hmm. But the reality of corporations Mm -hmm. 
a corporation exists on planet Earth to provide sh- value to shareholders. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? You do that through revenue growth. You do that through margin expansion. You always got to grow. So if you drop 100,000 pairs of this shoe this year, well, guess what? You got an anniversary that next year. Mm-hmm. And not only that, you have to hit the targets of growth. So if the target of growth is 10%, that 100,000 has become 110,000. Mm-hmm. That's one shoe. Now talk about an entire division, Every like Nike Sportswear, plus Nike Basketball, plus Nike Running, plus, you know? So uh, you end up getting in a space where, quite honestly, a lot of companies are probably doing it too, is you're producing too much product for the marketplace to actually absorb. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I mean, I have done shoes myself where it's like, yo, this is straight to outlet. It's going to go to Foot Locker. And then Foot Locker's going to have it for a month at full price. Yep. And then they're going to discount it. Mm-hmm. And then by month three, guess what? You need the new season coming into Foot Locker. Right. So then you're going, that's when like, Nike will come in or any of these other brands that have an outlet presence, they'll come in and do an RTV, return to vendor. Mm -hmm. And they'll uh, basically buy the shoes back and then they'll put them in their outlet business. So now once they're in the outlet business, like there, it becomes like a complex mathematical equation uh, where, and this may be off topic, but maybe not. And some of your viewers might uh, appreciate this. So, okay. If you have a hundred dollar shoe, Mm -hmm. Air Force One's 110 now, but let's, for yeah, sake yeah, of yeah, argument, yeah, let's yeah. say it's 100 because okay. the math is easier for me. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't have my calculator out. <laughs> Nike sells those products. Most athletic brands sell them for half mm-hmm. is the wholesale. Mm-hmm. I think Nike's is actually 53%. So okay. $100 Air Force One sells the Foot Locker for 53. Okay. Okay. And then Foot Locker sells. So Nike's selling it for 53. They got to make it for less than 53 to make money on it Mm -hmm. and to hit their margin targets, Mm -hmm. all right? Now, different businesses, based on the volume that they do, have different margin targets. So, Cleated, Cleated has, uh, you know, uh, plates on the bottom of their Mm -hmm. shoes Mm -hmm. and it's more expensive to make a Cleated lower margins for Cleated. Lower margin. Yeah. But something like Air Force One, where there's millions upon millions of pairs done every year. You know, I don't know what the number is now. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody said it was, you know, 10, 15 million pairs a year mm-hmm. were made. That drives margin. Mm-hmm. So you need that one to to um, help lift the rest of the business up so that whenever you want to do a new innovation, like... Um, like how they always integrate new, new running uh, materials you know, vapor or whatever. Fly or something. Yeah. Those tend to be low margin shoes as well. Okay. So if you think about that, the 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 top of the line running shoe is going to be two hundred fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. You're not going to sell as many two hundred fifty dollars running shoes as you're going to sell one hundred twenty dollars Pegasus. Right, right, right. Okay, so that two hundred fifty dollars is meant to be the tip of the spear, if you will. Okay, and you can take a lower margin on it because you have less pairs, which will do less. It, it will create less of a drain on your margin. Mm-hmm. But your hundred twenty dollars shoe, where you're going to sell five million pairs, you need that to drive margin. It pays for the innovations above it. Mm -hmm. So like it's this balancing act when you're looking at your business, where are we innovating? How are we going to put as much innovation? And and two, you don't want to price yourselves out of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Like you could get a great margin on that product, but you might have to charge $300 for it now. So what do you think? you want to sell even less. What do you think about, okay, so also to give to a perspective for like newer sneakerheads in the game, this is almost like how you see the Jordan 1 mid right now. Yes. And everybody said, quality on those are terrible. They're trash, right? Driving the margins. But that's what they use to get their margins for the Jordan They get volume on it. They get great margin on it. I would imagine they get great margin on the Jordan 1 high too, but mm-hmm. it's less volume. Right. But still considerable volume compared to a lot of the other retros. All the mids, and then yeah. obviously you got your but, premium uh, releases. So what's the price on the is, mid right now versus the high? Uh, I don't know because I don't buy mids for retail, but I'm assuming. <laughs> Team mid over here. Hey, hold up. I'm going to look into the camera for this one. MJ wore mids, by hey, the way. On. That's time a real. Out. That's a fact. Time out, time out, time MJ out. MJ wore mids on the court. <laughs> I like mids, but I like I like the era of mids like old 2006, love, Nula the old type. love, new love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like those type so, of mids. So, but whenever I was coming out here to Nike and before, actually, when I was working in, in retail, like the one wasn't that cool. I remember a day when the one was not like super cool, yo. I think for a long time, the one was not cool. It, the six rings what, were think, more popping than the ones. Oh, for sure. Back six, in rings, like 08. six rings, six um, rings, dub zeros, spizikes. 
Spiz Ikes, that first two colors of the Spiz Ike, oh, for sure. Kings County. Ooh. Yes. So, um, but the mid, I believe the one became popular right around the time. Do you remember when uh, MLK got the bands? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's when, what like. was that, 2011? Yes. Yeah. I think that was like the, the first the fuse that yeah. got lit. They're like, wait a minute. What? Wait a second. Because it was $109.99. Yes. Or $109. And uh, people were selling it for like $350, $400. Bucks. And they were I like, remember someone up. told me that they were there. It's one of the biggest shoe regrets of my life not going and getting a pair. I got 22 I pairs. Like, wow. <laughs> We need to talk about a size 12 when we're done here. Maybe a 13. I'll put an extra insole Bruh, in there. That's the other part. I sold them all. I literally ah. have one left. But now I know I'll yeah. look for a pair for you. But yeah, I got 22 pairs when they came out because I spent all my money I had at the time. I was like, this is so dope. Like, because my same thing, I was like, oh, I'm going to flip some, get some, keep some pairs. And I had kept some pairs and worn them for some years. And then when, you know, once I started selling stuff to buy the houses, I was like, oh, I can let go of these. I'll just keep my dead stock pair. Mm -hmm. But yeah. That that was, I think, a key moment uh, for the ones too, for sure. But yeah, I height. mean, so but back to your point, like the one, the one is for the masses, mm -hmm. and some of your people that are watching, some of your viewers that are watching will understand this. Some will not. Like, not everybody loves sneakers the way that we do. Believe it or not, right? We're at like it's a mainstream culture, if you will. But we're still a fragment of the population. So yeah. what the Jordan 1 mid is, is it's an acceptable, cool shoe mm -hmm. that doesn't cost a fortune. Your everyday consumer can walk into the Foot Locker yes, and, and I got a Jordan. I'm getting a piece of the dream. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And like, I don't know. Um, I have worked on I've worked on shoes that are $65 and I've worked on a shoe that's $400. Okay. A Nike Adapt. Mm -hmm. um, when I would work on a $65 shoe, for example, I briefed a shoe called the Son of Force. Okay. Why does so, that sound so familiar? It's a, it's a takedown of the Air Force One. Mm -hmm. And it takes oh. elements of the Air Force One, the Air Force Two, and the Air Force Three. That's right. And it was meant for Family Value Channel. Yeah. So when you go to a shoe carnival, when you go to uh, famous footwear, like it's a shoe that some kid's mom doesn't have $200 mm -hmm. to get him something crazy, mm -hmm. but it's still got a swoosh on the side of it. And it's still like, there's still value in that product. Those are the projects that are honestly the hardest to work on. And you have to find, my job was to find an insight on what a consumer found value in right. and then create a brief for a designer to design against. Mm -hmm. And like, it's easy when you're a designer to like, Oh, I'm going to work on the, the $300 sneaker or the 250. I can put everything into it that I want to. It's a much more difficult task to work on a $65 shoe. But what I did in those briefing sessions was I found videos of kids doing unboxings. And the way you or Jacques Slade or any other like big time uh, sneaker YouTuber does an unboxing mm -hmm. of like the hotness, mm -hmm. there's also a kid out there that's doing an unboxing of an alpha baller that's a $70 shoe. And you know what? He's just as hype about that $70 shoe as is as you are of getting a, you know, Travis Scott. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would show those videos like, hey, I know this is a $65 shoe, but we have to put our heart and soul into this one like because the kid deserves it. It's the same concept of Michael Jordan showing up every night because you never know who's in the 300 section mm -hmm. that their parents, you know, scrapped enough money together to come to the game. He wants to give them a show. Right. You know? Right. So it's like you have to... You have to rise to the occasion, mm -hmm. if you will, and try to put as much value in those shoes. And like, honestly, I'm super proud of that shoe. Like, it's not something that any of your viewers would probably ever wear. Ever wear. Right. But like, I'm proud of it because it's, I don't know if it's still in the line right now, but I know it was around for about four years. Okay. So, and it did crazy volume. It had good margin. And you know what? Some kid that's wearing it, he might not get clowned because he doesn't have some Bobos on or some Silver Streaks. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, that is like, that's the other part. What Nike does, what a lot of brands do is like you try to create a halo 
with stuff at the top. And then you draft off of that halo, and then you try to provide to the masses. Okay. I mean, it's like, yo, it's like going and getting that Kirkland Kirkland <laughs> tea from uh, from Costco, right. you know, right. which is like kind of ironically cool right now, which is an interesting thing. But low key, you know how many Costco's there are? Right. If you're to book an order with Costco, I don't know how many pairs you do, but I know that it's in the tens of twenties of thousands for you know, one order probably, mm-hmm. if not more. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a uh, a place where you can get your product on more people, you know, and there's no no shame in that, right? You know, like, like Shaq. Yeah, Shaq is like, I make affordable shoe. I want to. I want to be able to put shoes on kids and people that can't afford it, and still give them the opportunity to wear shoes, and not have holes in them and stuff like that. Exactly. I like that. Okay, so speaking of Shaq, it makes me think of celebrities. I know you worked with some people. Man. I know you got some stories. Okay. I don't know if you want to begin at a certain point or if you want to just touch on some highlights or whatever throughout your career. Because people that work at Nike, especially at these higher up levels, they get some dope projects with some dope creative athletes or designers or whatever it may be. So I'll let you kind of go wherever you want to go with that. All right. So I've worked in sportswear and then I've worked in performance basketball, both of which I uh, got to work with a lot of athletes um, in sports where I just kind of go through the list and then there, there are definitely some, some memorable moments mm-hmm. from those um, in sports where uh, far and away, the coolest uh, athlete that I got to work with on a personal level as a fan. And mm-hmm. you can't be a fan when you're in the job. You can't ask for autographs. <laughs> I can't get a selfie with you. You have to keep it professional. So they're like, Yo, you're working with so and so this week, and you're like, oh. on the inside, right? Yeah, on the inside, I'm you know screaming like an eight year old boy, like getting ready to watch my favorite player. Mm-hmm. On the outside, just keeping it cool. That's oh, what's that's, up, man. Yeah, all right. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> all right. Um, so who's those? Bo people? Jackson. Bo Jackson. Bruh. Oh. <laughs> I got to work on Bo Jackson product. Uh, so I worked with this designer who's over in Jordan now, named Is, and we had this whole play on words. So like we did, um, you remember the Bo Nose ads Mm -hmm. where um, there's like one poster where he's a surfer, he's a jockey, Mm -hmm. he's, he's everything, you know, it was just lined up. So we did a play on words. We did Bo Tucky Derby. Mm -hmm. So he was uh, the jockey on Mm -hmm. that. And because um, from a cultural reference standpoint, the, um, the the Bo Jackson of Tecmo Bowl, which is my era, <laughs> it's unstoppable. Like that little eight bit graphic of Bo uh, is a you know a cultural touch point because like a lot of people that like sneakers like video games too, mm-hmm. you know. So um, is created this really cool graphic. We did it on the Air Trainer Three. Um, it had some pink on it. It had like a argyle print um, that was like pink and yellow. And then on the tongue, there was like uh, a little tiny Bo Jackson on a horse, mm-hmm. like riding a horse. That was <laughs> Bo Tucky Derby. We did um, Bo and Arrow mm-hmm. because Bo likes to hunt. <laughs> so we took the Air Trainer 2 and we had like this Bo and Arrow story. Mm-hmm. Um, we did we did a lot of different things. We did uh, Broken Bats. Uh, that one was actually Mark Dolce did That's that tough. one. That's tough. Dolce was a great designer to work with. Uh, and he was a huge fan of Bo as well. So we did like um, a, tr- a trainer SC in the um, Royals colorways with the number 16 on the back. So, and it was in the the 8-bit font. And then on the bottom of it, it said Broken Bats. It was like a clear outsole. Mm-hmm. So we did a lot of that different stuff uh, with Bo, which was awesome. So so you got to like, did you go to his house or did he come no, to so you? No, so Bo or would like, like um, Bo... Usually the athletes will have a meeting once a year. Okay. It's a business meeting. Okay. They learn about what their business is doing. Uh, and then you show them product. And they'll have a sports marketing guy. Okay. For Bo, his guy was really the they call him the general, Lynn Merritt. If mm-hmm. there's anyone you could ever get on a podcast, I don't know if you could get him on. Lynn is gonna have the best stories. Hey, pull up, man. Lynn is uh the godfather of sports marketing there he just recently retired oh uh, yeah he could pull up next yo, week for, you got time <laughs> um lynn single-handedly responsible for signing lebron Jeez. um he is uh 
man, the dude is just like, he's a legend. Mm-hmm. And I always had a ton of respect for him. But anyway, he was like Bo's guy, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but the athletes would come on campus once a year for, you know, a few days. They'd have like an event. Mm-hmm. I remember Bo's event was uh, something on the the field at the Bo Jackson Fitness Center. Right. Uh, where people could, you know, meet with him and that kind of stuff. And then there's like segments of time where you show, hey, this is the product that we're planning. And you get the athlete's approval, feedback, if they hate something, if they love something. Gotcha. Okay. You know, all depends on the athlete. Some cats, they just ready to just sign the check. Right. Do whatever. Barkley, Give me hey, money. do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Barkley's good with it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, as long as the checks keep coming. Other athletes are more involved in the process. But mm-hmm. anyway, so I've done, I've worked on Barkley product. Never actually got to meet Barkley. Really? Because he just, you know, he just wants to check. Right. You basically got to give the design over. They send the design. Yep, that looks good. You know. <sighs> You said they retro. Make sure you got my direct deposit uh, correct. Colorway. What's that? They retro this Phoenix Suns. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. So worked on that product. Uh, I worked on Penny Hardaway product. Worked on like foam posit uh, one. Tell them about the foam posit, the chrome posit. Oh yeah. So the yeah we did uh, worked on the chrome posit uh, for All Star Weekend in Brooklyn. I believe it was that year. Yep. Twenty fifteen. But the struggles the years before. So it took years to make the chrome posit. I remember the whole process. Yo, it took years for the factory and our developers to figure out how to make it. And at the end of the day, like some of y'all watching are going to know as soon as they get wet, the chrome peels off and bubbles up. Yeah. So the idea was like, how do we do something that hasn't been done on the posit? You can only do so many colors on Mm -hmm. the posit. The posit had become a huge business, gargantuan. How much? Uh, probably itself. Um, I'd have to do the math, but like we were doing close to 100K for a drop, 100,000 pairs. Okay. So do and that. And those were retailing at what, 230? 230. Yeah. Times 0.53. Let's say 125 just to be 125 times 100,000 is what? I don't know. 2.5 million? What is that? It's more than that. Let's, I'm getting the calculator yeah, out. Yeah, do it. Where's my phone at? That's one launch. Right. Hold on. Hold on. This is going to blow people's minds. So let's say 230 times 0.53 times 100,000. That's $12 million. Oh, my gosh. For one drop. Now, between the Phone Posit 1 and the Phone Posit Pro, how many were they dropping a year? Yo, we were dropping like, one of each a season. Yeah. And then we would also throw in some extras from time to time. Okay. Maybe a Christmas drop, maybe an all star drop. Yeah. So now you're going to say, on average, uh, let's say just, let's be generous and say it's just eight drops a year. And this is just at wholesale, like right. uh, revenue pricing. Right. Granted, Nike.com uh, would get their pairs too. But times eight, it's, yeah, I was going to say 95 million off the top of my head. It's 97. So close so to a massive million. business. So for all y'all that complain about how many phone posits were dropping, it's simple mathematics. Like, what are you going to replace that with? What two hundred and thirty dollars shoe can you put in the market that's going to do a hundred thousand pairs? Mm-hmm. There isn't one to make a hundred million dollars like that. No. So then, like, it's almost like a, an addiction. Mm-hmm. The needle is in the vein, and you can't pull it out. Right. So I had tried multiple times while they're like, hey, we got to put this thing, we got to pump the brakes. And it got put to it, that point. We yeah. got to put it back on the, in, the, in the archives right. to make people hunger for it again. Mm-hmm. But it's not a solution where you can just sub in one shoe for it. Mm-hmm. To do that, you probably have to put in another five or six shoes mm-hmm. to comp that volume and that revenue. So then you throw five or six shoes in, all of a sudden you're putting pressure on a team that's only resourced for so much work. Right. So long story short, we just kept churning them out. Got you. I did not have anything to do with the weathermans. <laughs> I did not have anything to do. Nah, not me. I just want to look right into that camera there and let y'all know. 
not your boy. Okay. Hey, I'm not gonna lie to y'all. He I did a- do the uh the 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 China posits that were um those was hard though. Yeah, I like those. Yeah. No, you he was a part of some of the most fire phone posits that was coming out during the phone posit era of greatness. Like I remember all the times you have you hit me, like showing me something. I'm like, bro, these are crazy each time. Like we tried not to I there was an era right before I started working on posits where there was a lot of graphic phone posits. Yeah. That's what I wanted to get away from. I wanted to go back into textures and treatments. So like one, as soon as I heard all gold, everything, you know, from Trinidad James, got to do a gold posit. Yep. It's not going to be on time because like your development calendar is 18 months out. Right. But like gold's a uh, precious metal. It's not going anywhere. Right. So when I heard all gold, everything, I was like, yo, got to do a gold phone posit. Yep. So we did the one. And then, you know what? Come back to it on uh, a, a co-worker of mine came back to it on the pro and he did it in a herringbone. And switch the texture. I was just about to say. Switch, switch the, the texture, texture up. Yep. You know? So that kind of stuff. We did um, gone fishing mm-hmm. posits. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, had some fish scale on it. Uh, so that's where, because there are only so many colors in the uh, color wheel. For where me, it gets repetitive. So it's like, how do you flip it up and tell a story? Yeah. That, yeah. you know, somewhat keeps it interesting. Um, some that did good, some that did, like, we th- we did some packs, right? We did the penny pack where All there was a Sharpies. All those packs were basically down bad. People did not want the penny yeah. six. Was it six? It was just too much. Like, the retail was way too yeah. high. For but the reality on the shoe. story, the story's dope. Mm-hmm. Because Penny took a Sharpie and put the stripes on right. his own posits. Right. So we, we took photos of how that had happened and um we recreated it mm-hmm. the the reality is is some level of greed got in there and we threw a second shoe in the box that people didn't want right. you know it's almost like the um original cdp packs yep. which like you're going to get one that you wanted and one you didn't yep. i wanted the three if i was going to get a 20 don't give me the black cat 20 give me give me the black patent leather 20 right. and i would have been happy right. but the problem too though like the CDP packs was like 300, 310 bucks or something like yes. that. Yes. Phone posit packs was like 500. Yeah, they were ridiculous. And we did two of those. And you I want people to spend of those. $500 on a pack 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Like that's a With lot. With inflation, that's probably like 950 yeah, right now. Yeah. You know? That's like they're dropping a pack now and yep. it's like 750. Like uh-huh. they're just asking for too much. So, okay. Yeah. Phone posit era was great. This and is Penny when- was dope. Penny so, was like oh, Penny. Yeah. Penny, you know, was uh, he? He engaged. I know Dolce designed like the little Penny posit. Dolce designed the Penny five and the Penny six, uh, and he was always able to go and like connect with Penny. And you know, for what it's worth, Penny low key is probably like second place in sneaker culture behind MJ. Yo, for real. In terms of on the streets and what people will like wear and rock with. I mean, I can't even, I don't know if I could argue with that. Bro, I saw Penny play in high school. Yeah. And uh, a tournament in Raleigh when I was growing up. He had 46. Damn. And that was before Carmelo. He was the best player I had ever seen Damn. in high school at that time. But like, so it's a full circle moment to mm-hmm. like seeing him when I was a kid in the stands to like being able to work on his product and, and you know, have a, a part in his business. And it was just cool. You know? So how's that go to like, you know, I know you're not the top of managing these businesses, but pretty high up in those scales of all these different businesses, because literally we see it as like, oh, this you released the Air Force One came out the off white, the this, the that, the other. But these are businesses within the business of Nike. And you're like, I have to manage a, like you said, $100 million shoe line on this. $50 $50 million on that, 20, whatever it may be, or be in rooms with those type of conversations. Yeah. Like, what is it even like going through that thought process and being in those meetings? Like, damn, um, we're really <clears throat> messing with big numbers here. So they are big numbers, but um, if there are any wire fans in your audience, Prop Joe says it best buy for a dollar, sell for two. Mm-hmm. Like, at its core, that's what business is. Mm-hmm. And what I had to educate myself on was, um, the mechanics of um, Excel, mm-hmm. Microsoft Excel. Yeah, yeah. You know, low key, like, man, you can learn anything on YouTube, which is why this guy here is like crushing it. <laughs> you can learn anything on YouTube. Yeah. I've learned how to do, um, I've learned how to do pivot tables. I've learned how to concatenate. I've learned so much from um, YouTube that when I don't know how to do something, I instantly just go to YouTube 
I'll refresh myself and I'll do it. And what Excel allows you to do specifically a pivot table is like slice up your information Mm -hmm. in ways that are digestible. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to look at my entire product line, slice and dice your business, how you want to look at it. You can look at it by season. You can look at it by category. You can, you can look at it however you want to the Mm -hmm. moment you learn how to do them. So then it's about like knowing your stuff and knowing your numbers. Um, And, you know, uh, The world of product creation is not just all coming up with ideas, but it's like, yeah, actually managing the business and being able to speak intelligently um, to the higher ups, you know, the senior leadership team about, you know, where you see growth coming from, what your trajectory is, where things are slowing down. Mm -hmm. Because part of that is like we're planning so far out in the future, but you got to be aware and cognizant of uh, what's happening in the marketplace right now Mm -hmm. and trends are cyclical. They go away. Right now, I've seen a lot of videos on IG about like uh, a lot of hate for the Panda Dunk. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say that the Panda Dunk is probably at towards the tail end of its life cycle. Mm -hmm. And the shoe that's coming up that you're seeing more and more uh, is the Samba Mm -hmm. from Adidas. So there's like a a life cycle. And what I noticed was is when it's... um, I don't do not mean this to be offensive to anyone. It's when 13 year old girls are wearing it. Right. That's the end of the life cycle. Right. So the Samba is not there yet. The Samba is kind of on like cool kids, if you will. You know, it's becoming more ubiquitous and you're seeing it more places. But like the Panda Dunk is everywhere. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen with so many shoes. I've seen it happen with white, white Air Force Ones. I've seen it happen with the white and black uh, Adidas shell toe mm-hmm. or the Superstar. I've seen it happen with the Stan Smith. You know, you're seeing it happen with the Dunk. And it will happen with the Samba. And then what is that next it shoe that's going to come up mm-hmm. and, um, you know, be the thing that that everybody wants to get a piece of. But people get tired of the same stuff, so they want something new. Right. So that's it's just the nature of the business. So you have to be aware of that and try to predict that, which you're not always going to predict right, you mm-hmm. know? And then, yeah, it's crazy because, like you said, 18 months out, right? So it's like, just like, you know, how everybody's like, oh, they're on the Jordan 2 narrative right now. Da, 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 da. It's like, yeah, they chose that 18 months, 24 mm-hmm. months ago, and they're on that now. And then they talk about, like you said, anniversaries mm-hmm. and different things that align with that stuff. And then the consumers see it and they're like, oh, I don't like this or whatever. And it's like, you just got to get through the season of that. Yep. And, <laughs> and then there'll be the something else thing. behind it. That's why, I, I mean, when I was a, a younger, I used to I used to um, kick myself when I'd miss out on a pair of sneakers mm-hmm. or not was not able to get something. And then at a certain point, I just realized there's always going to be something else that I want. So, like, if I can't get this one, cool, I'll just get the next one. Right. And that's why, like, we're in an age now where a lot of stuff is on discount. This is a great time to be a sneakerhead because, like, man, wear what you buy, what you like, wear what you like. Don't seek validation from anyone else. Don't look to others to dictate your style. Who cares if what you have is not the it sneaker? If you like it, that should be good enough for you, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and it's a great time to to be. A consumer because you can get some heat for not a lot you know maybe you're not going to get like the the top tier travis scott or whatever but like there's plenty of heat out there for people to have for sure and that's why i love making those videos like affordable under 200 mm-hmm. or affordable 150 225 250 because there's a lot of bangers it's like people G-Rock are from on. the shoe game Shout out G-Rock. G-Rock has a great thread on his Instagram that's like outlet finds. Mm-hmm. I always love whenever he posts that on on, on IG um, because like you see what's at the outlet. And that would be one of my things here. Um, when the outlet on MLK was open, I would try to go like every Saturday. Mm-hmm. I, got, um, I got so much heat from there on that back wall too. The hash wall is what we called it. I got so much heat on that hash Definitely. wall. Definitely. Yeah. I got the um, Footskate Wovens, the black with the rainbow. Mm-hmm. Got those there. I was just about to say, I remember those used yeah. to be out there. Heaters, the uh, neck breakers. <laughs> yeah. Anytime yeah. somebody sees you wearing them, it's an acquired taste. Not everybody's into the, the foot skate, but when I wear them, doesn't matter if it's a you know, 17-year-old kid or an 82-year-old man. 
somebody, those, both of those people are going to say, those are some cool shoes, right. young man. Right, you know? right, right. Or, yo, what are those? Right. Like, you're always going to get a conversation started with that, that shoe. And mm -hmm. I got that at the outlet for the Lolo. That's, you know? that's what's so dope about it. Okay, so back on the topic of the athletes. Okay. I need to hear more about these juicy stories from the inside stuff nope. that nobody ever knows about. Uh, Ken Griffey. Awesome athlete to work with. Uh, he was like super kind and he gave uh, the team that was working on his product, he gave us bats, Dope. signed bats. That's what's up. Um, I gave mine because I'm not a huge baseball fan. I gave mine uh, to, uh, um, you know, somebody else that worked at Nike as well, but he was a massive baseball fan. Mm. So like I gave it to him. I'm going to tell you, there was a little bit of remorse on my on my part afterwards, but I don't think, I don't really think twice about it because like at the end of the day, he would value that more than I do. Uh, but Griffey, like the team went down to his crib to do some stuff for him. We were working on like some actual new Griffey models, like some Griffey Max stuff and uh, got to see his automobiles. He has a plane uh, and it's like, oh, we're going to base this one off of his... Uh, you know, his Ferrari or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, you just, I was exposed to so much cool stuff that I've never been exposed to before. Like I got to see behind the curtain, if you will, of mm -hmm. how, you know, a mega famous um, athlete is able to live. Uh, they don't live like the rest of us. Right. They got personal chefs, you know, there's people that do things for them. Like if they need some errands ran. They're not. They're not going out to run their own errands. Right. You like, know, I'd there's really, somebody there to yeah. do that. Uh, because for them, I guess time is is money, mm -hmm. and it's their their time could be spent. You know, uh, practicing their craft. But Griffey was dope. Um, when I got into performance basketball, I spent my last three years at Nike in performance basketball, and um, I got to work with KD. I got to work with LeBron. I got to work with Kobe. Everybody wants to know about Kobe. Bro, uh, so I was not even you, a Kobe fan. You can to begin spend a with. whole episode talking yeah, yeah, about Yeah, for sure. For Kobe. sure. I was not a Kobe fan to begin with. All right. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, all right, you're going to be working on Kobe products. So maybe you should like, I am the person that needs to have like an, an investment. In. I was going to say, you got to buy in. I got to buy in. Yep. So the way I bought in was I watched Spike Lee uh, doing work, Kobe doing work. Okay. And I could not hate on them. I was a, I'm a Laker hater, first off. I'm not a Laker fan. <laughs> okay. But I could not hate on that man after watching Kobe doing work because mm -hmm. of the attention to detail that he put in his craft, the hard work, the hours, the blood, sweat, and tears, literally. And uh, from that point on, I became a huge fan. And um, the conversations that were had um, – with him in the moments, the times that I was able to to go and share a product with him and get his insights, like he's far and away uh, the most um, insightful athlete. They can not only tell you where they want to go, they can give you the why behind the solution that they need. Okay, and then they let the designer like solve that. But like Kobe's the best. Mm -hmm. His insights, his insights led to the Kobe Four, which was like. Low cut basketball shoe. If you remember around that time, it was like, oh, you can't wear a low cut because low cut, you're going to sprain your ankle in. Right. Everybody's wearing mids or highs. Like that. It's not that low cut basketball shoes didn't exist before then. They did, but Just like it level. wasn't the the choice for yeah. athletes. Kobe made it okay for people to wear low cut basketball shoes. But you know what? His insights came from soccer and like the fact that he grew up in Italy and soccer has a lot of lateral movement too. You don't see a ton of like people, you know, spraining their ankle out on the soccer. I'm sure that it happens, but um, there's something there that triggered Kobe. He knew like they needed that uh, flexibility and movement, mm -hmm. freedom of range of movement in their shoes to be the best they could be. And he wanted to put that into his basketball shoes, which is what led to that. So like Kobe was super dope. I remember I was working on EXT. Mm -hmm. I was actually in mm -hmm. sportswear and we did like the uh, Kobe 9 and we did one in snakeskin. And then we did one in red with the Curum that's on the Yeezy 3, the, yeah, the, the Red yeah. Octobers. Yep, I remember and, that. And, um, you know, like, love or hate that, I don't think that shoe was anything, you know, it was not revolutionary. But I remember telling Kobe, like, the story was Mamba Couture. Mm. So it's like, how do we take stuff from the runway and put it on your performance shoe? And, like, Kobe loved his eyes lit up when I said Mamba Couture. And like, man, I just felt like um, 
you know, whether that shoe sell, sold out or not, it was like, yo, I did my job that day because right, like right. Kobe, yeah. Kobe loved the concept, yeah. you know? So Kobe was super dope. Um, KD, KD was also, he went to Oak Hill for a year and then he transferred to Montrose. So um, I opened up by telling KD that he was the second best shooter that ever played at Oak Hill. <laughs> He's like, yo, what are you talking about? So then we started talking about Coach Smith and that just like instantly... There's a kinship there, mm -hmm. um, and we know some of the the some you know there's some mutual friends there through my time in in, in basketball. Uh, but what I dig about KD is what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. Like people are going to give him so much flack for when he went to the Golden State Warriors or whatever, but like man, Co KD is just a real dude, and maybe he gets on Twitter or whatever. I'm not even mad at him for that. Like. I just love to – he's he's the quintessential hooper that mm -hmm. just wants to hoop. All right. That's all he wants to do. Get me on a court with a ball, and I'm going to hoop, you know? Um, so, like, he – to me, he was super dope uh, to work with. I started working with him on the KD-12. I was like, about to say, though, I feel like his shoes, like – They fell off after the four, but, like, yeah. well, maybe the six. He had, like, a three or four shoe run. Yep. And then after that, well, it was so like, that's interesting you say that. So um, the golden era for basketball shoes, you're saying that from the standpoint of not necessarily people hooping in the shoes, but people wearing the shoes right. on the street. Right. That changed in 2015. Because, yeah, that was... You know why yeah. that changed in 2015? My hypothesis? What? Kanye West. Yeah. Kanye goes to Adidas. Okay. And he comes with the Yeezy mm -hmm. uh, over there. Of course, there was the Yeezy 1 and the Yeezy 2, which are arguably the most hype shoes that Nike's ever dropped. Right. And um, he releases Fax, Charlie, uh, Charlie Heat Edition, mm -hmm. you know. But <clears throat> All-Star Weekend, the weekend that we dropped the Chrome Posit. Yeah. Brooklyn, All-Star Game. Man, it was freezing. Oh, yeah. It was so cold. Do you remember Kanye did a free concert for like 10,000 people? Yeah. So like, maybe they didn't sell more shoes that weekend than Nike did, but they took over the culture that weekend. Mm -hmm. I remember standing in front of a pair of Yeezys that were in the window at, at Adidas it's almost like if you walk by a Rolex store and they've got that little tiny window and mm -hmm. the Rolexes are, are in there. There was a Yeezy that was in there, the 750. Mm -hmm. And I remember some people that I was with, no names will be mentioned, but they were clowning them like Yeezy Uggs. I'm just like, all right, you just wait. Man got the, the he had the culture in a chokehold. Right. And it, it was at that moment that the entertainer became more influential than the athlete. And that's why I like KDs and how many LeBrons do you see on the street? How right. many, you know? Yeah, it eliminated that. It funny. eliminated performance basketball as a lifestyle option. Yeah, I was just about to say, that's actually funny because I never thought about it that way, but it did. I remember that slow transition of like, you're not wearing those in the streets no yep. more. Like, So when I took over KD's business, it was well after that had, um, when I started working on it, it was well after that had happened. It's like, all right, let's just get back to basics and let's make the best basketball shoe that we can make. Mm. For people and, that want to hoop, that, that's Katie's when it came hooper. back to like people like rocking with it again. Yeah, because it was at yeah, KD the 12, twelve had the innovation of zoom strobe with the with the laces through the net mm -hmm. or on the mesh on the upper right. Mm -hmm. That was a twelve. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. It, but it had a zoom strobe was the big innovation, which is a strobe is that if you take your sock liner out, there's usually like a um, you know a piece of fabric mm -hmm. that feels kind of hard. That is how when you make a shoe. Um, uh, the upper is a two dimensional shape. All right. It's like flat. The pattern mm -hmm. is, and then you put a last in it, you know, where you sew it, you sew the, um, I could show you if, with a pair of shoes, but like you basically put the strobel, that little piece of fabric, you sew it around the bottom mm -hmm. of that upper pattern. And then that creates a three dimensional shape and then it gets lasted, gotcha. which is the plastic shape that looks like a foot that goes in a shoe, it gives it its shape. And then, you know, the bottom is attached usually through, through glue. Mm -hmm. So what the Zoom Strobel did is it replaced that little piece of fabric because it's the closest thing to your foot. Mm. Replace it with the Zoom Air unit. Gotcha. So that was like a monumental innovation, particularly for basketball because Zoom has always been the preferred cushion. 
and it um, brought the cushion closer to your foot so you could experience what it meant to feel like. Mm. So then it was a progression of like, as you're planning, like there's a big business and then there's individual pillars of that business. So within basketball, it was like your non-signature product and then your signature athletes. So, But you have to plan. You don't just plan willy-nilly one shoe at a time. You're trying to plan out a journey. Right. So the 12 started with... Um, 12 started with Zoom Strobel was the innovation. Then the 13 went to um, Kushlon, which is a better foam than regular EVA foam Mm -hmm. and Zoom Strobel. Um, And then I think we actually added an an additional air unit in there. Uh, The 14 became like, how do we put React in there with Zoom Strobel? Mm -hmm. So it's like you're building these three-year progressions of how are we going to make the product incrementally better Mm -hmm. uh, and give a better benefit for the consumer. Um, so that's like how we approach that. And at the end of the day, it was like, we were not trying to make a shoe that someone's going to wear off the court because the reality is nobody's wearing a basketball shoe off the court. What you barking at, bro? Um, he wants to wear some hoop shoes off the court, maybe. (laughs) Um, so, you know, you just try to build the best basketball shoe possible, build a hoop shoe for people that want to hoop. Built like uh, what is the the movie with Kevin Costner in it? Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Mm-hmm. So it's like we make basketball shoes. Got you. So let's make really good basketball shoes. Let's get back to that and stop trying to be streetwear. Right. There's enough streetwear. You're never going to beat Nike sportswear at their own game. <laughs> right. So like that's the interesting thing about Nike is like all these businesses are ran by different groups mm-hmm. and. Nike's filled with hyper competitive people. And yeah, like, and then they're you know like, what I'm oh, saying? So then it's like, them. what you got to do is not cannibalize each other. Yeah. Let people have their lane. It's, and that's interesting too. How How is the, just the work culture inside of Nike, especially on stuff like that, on the competitive side with different brands and even, you know, with your own group, your own team? Because there's small teams that you have that you manage or that manage you or whatever. Like, how is that all? I think it's like anywhere that you go, anywhere you go, there are going to be people that, have a great amount of passion for what they do Mm -hmm. and pride in their work. Um, And then there are going to be people where it's just a job Mm -hmm. and they just clock in nine to five. uh, And there's always going to be, um, you know, people that you don't get along with their working style. Mm -hmm. Some people that you really rock with their working style. Um, So at the end of the day, like, The biggest, when you're in a position of, um, to hire people, Mm -hmm. that's what Gentry taught me in my time with him in sportswear is like the biggest impact you can have on an organization are the people that you bring in to that team. Mm -hmm. So it's no different from a basketball team. I don't need five shooting guards. I need one shooting guard. I need somebody that's going to be willing to do the dirty work, set picks and get rebounds. Mm-hmm. I'm going to need somebody that's like going to facilitate and doesn't care about getting their shop because they're going to set the, they're going to set the other people up. Right. Same thing with the team. You got to build your team in that aspect. Mm-hmm. And you know, um, that takes time to do. And the reality is, it's like teams don't last forever. Mm-hmm. So people, you know, move on to other jobs. Pat Riley called it the disease of me. <laughs> okay, okay. The so, disease of me is like when you win championships, now it's I want mine. Right, right. And then everybody gets split up. They yep. go to different teams. They get a different paycheck, whatever. You, you mm-hmm. see it all the time in sports. What was the best team that you worked on throughout in, your years in, in Nike? In sportswear? Or in general, just oh. your years in Nike. Like what team was the, what was your, the greatest, I most fun really team? I really loved this team I had in Nike sportswear. Um with a uh, my man Marcus Kaus, aka Chaos. Okay. Nico Fern. Nico. Yep. And then <laughs> G Money at the at the helm of the ship. That's a fire squad, because I know that's a that's a good squad. Yep. I uh so I was uh with Gentry on a market travel trip to Atlanta. Okay. And you haven't met Chaos, he's somebody you should have. Okay. If he's here, he should pull up because my man's got stories for days. Uh, he's very like, he's in the hip hop community. He's got a, a group called Ultra Beast United, okay. which is pretty dope. Um, but anyways, um, we were on a market travel trip to Atlanta and Chaos was an Eakin. 
And Explain to them what an Eakin an is. Eakin basically is a um, tech rep of product that goes to different retailers in their area. They're usually given a state. If it's like New York, it's just going to be the city. But like they're given an area to cover and they go tech out product. They help brand marketing do activations. So if there's like a, you know, a Nike race or something, they'll help with that. Uh, if there's a new launch of like a football cleat, they'll, they'll, They'll go and be the product expert that really describes uh, for the the audience that's there, like, hey, what's the benefit of this? Why do you need to buy this type okay, of thing? They get to do a bunch of cool shit. They do lots of cool stuff. <laughs> and Eakin is Nike spelled backwards, which, like, they should know the product forwards and backwards. Yeah. Uh, and I always, like, wanted to be an Eakin. I never got that opportunity. Literally, probably the most well-planned visit that we've ever had to a city. Okay. And we left there saying, like, he needs to be our next PLM. When we have a spot open, like, we need to hire that guy okay. and get him out to Oregon. So I would always, when I go into a city, I would connect and build relationships. And, like, I would stay in contact with him until we had a position. And we ended up hiring him. Mm -hmm. And then we got Nico from the innovation team uh, at Nike. And that that squad, to answer your question, the best squad I've ever worked on was that team. Mm -hmm. um, I will say I work for Cole Hahn now, and I love my team at Cole Hahn. Mm -hmm. It's a very different environment. So Nike's a massive corporation. Cole Hahn is much smaller. Chill. Um, chill, yes, but like um, everybody is willing to pitch in, mm -hmm. and it's not so like – everyone has their individual lanes and you better not step on anybody's toes. Mm -hmm. Nah, we, we all like pitch in and sometimes we do things that are outside of the scope of our role, mm -hmm. but there's a lack of ego there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's what the, the team, like from the brand president, uh, down to like the vice president of footwear, uh, and then the people that work for the vice president of footwear, the designers, developers that we have, like, man, I really appreciate it's so much of a different experience from Nike. Uh, but it's been good because I've learned about a whole different game, dress shoes, brown mm -hmm. shoes. Mm -hmm. We do sneakers too, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we do performance running. Um, but we kind of do it all. And I've had an opportunity to work on a lot of that stuff, uh, try to create some heat, worked on some collaborations. We have some cool ones coming up 2024. So stay tuned. Cole high, baby. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I've had, that's a really uh, solid team that I work for. And like, that's the thing about this industry, man, is just meeting like-minded people mm -hmm. like yourself. We uh, connected with each over with each other over a passion for sneakers, yep. and we've built a relationship. I've known you now for probably twelve years. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like yeah, that's man, a long yeah. time. It's been a minute, man. And um, since before you were in college, it was dope because I didn't even know if we were going to talk about this, but it was dope because I was telling Alexis this. Like we got to see each other grow. And we talked about this before. Like, we, Yo, uh, yeah, I was not even in footwear, I think, whenever I first met like you. You were just like getting your feet and just wet, getting in, like, yeah. in mm -hmm. there on campus doing mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, I was just like, you know, emerging into college mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And it was dope how you'd be like, I'm about to do this one day and I'm going to do that. And this is what I got to do to get here. And I'd be like, I'm about to do this. I'm about to do that. And like, yeah, we didn't talk to each other every day, but... You know, whether it was three months, six months, sometimes even a year mm -hmm. apart, like, and we'd catch up and it was like, it'd be dope to always just like mm -hmm. vibing through sneakers because that was our, you know, the thing that brought us together. But then like connecting outside of that oh, for man. life and everything too. Yep. Um, and building that relationship through shoes was dope. Dude, I'm uh, blown away at what you've been able to achieve. Like, I, you are an impressive person. And to see, you know, my son is 10 years old and uh, loves the idea of like being a content creator. Yeah. So to know, like he looks at you and it's like, yo, you've met Mr. Beast. Right, right, and, right. And like, you're a star to him. Right. And when I told him I was going to come over here and be on a podcast with you, he was like super hyped about that. Yeah. It's like, well, you got to send it to me. Is it live? When is it going to be <laughs> on? You know, but to see what you have achieved through having a vision and having, um, the tenacity to follow through yeah. on it and like take the steps to get there. You're, you're, uh, I'm proud to be able to call you a friend. 
You know what I'm saying? Right. No, so like I, I, I don't say that with all seriousness. I can say the same thing, bro. Like I appreciate you too for like being there, answering my questions. To me, it might have been a dumb question or whatever, but it was like you enjoyed seeing me like want to learn things and mm-hmm. everything. And then however I could always help whenever I could, I always feel like I tried to provide as much value as I could, knowing that I'm like younger with less things available to provide. But I don't know. I feel like we've always had a really good uh relationship yep. and and I like what you're doing as well. And it's dope because I always get so excited because I'm like, bro, you've had such a dope impact on the game. And that's why it's so dope to have you here because people will see these shoes and all these products and these stories and these special releases. And I'm like, I know who worked on this project. I know who did this. And not only did they do that, they got a great story behind it. And all the effort that you put in, like you said, Chrome Posit, whatever, like years of work to make this one thing happen and mm-hmm. all these different projects. So I don't know. I think it's dope. Same thing. It helps me know that like, hey, you got to stay consistent. You got to yep. work on stuff. It's not overnight. Like it takes years to make things get to where you want it to be. So I appreciate all that too. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. So we got all that out, all the mushy stuff. Now, <laughs> do you have any uh, other great secrets for us? The secrets of the inside of Nike that nobody ever tells the world? Um, that's a good one. I don't, I don't know that I have anything that just stuff that people don't necessarily think about the amount of people that touch your product before Mm -hmm. it reaches you. Like there's a whole army of people from whoever's, uh, concepting the ideas to who's designing it, to the developers that are doing it, to the costing engineer that's helping you figure out, Mm -hmm. you know, are we profitable enough? Like if we switch this material out for this material, we can save 32 cents to the factory and the amount of people that are touching it on the line. I've had the pleasure to travel overseas, uh, and, and be in factory settings. Um, and it's no, um, no joke, man. Like there's a ton of people, the more complex the shoe, the more hands that touch it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it typically gets on a boat and then it's on that boat for a couple months before it reaches, um, you know, reaches its destination. Then it goes to a distribution center, like all the way into retail. So I guess the secret would be like, there's no shortage of avenues to get into this game if mm-hmm. that's what you want to do and mm-hmm. that's what you love to do. Um, there's value in all of those positions, all the way from the sales associate to you know the the designer that's designing the product. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can, if you if you love something, find a way to get paid for it. Yeah. So if you love sneakers, you get paid for it. Like there's a way in for anyone. Yeah. What is some what is some advice you would give somebody that really wants to work for Nike that's excited by hearing this pod and is like because you hear the classic like people I'm sure I don't know if a lot of people I've heard of PLMs before plenty of times right mm-hmm. and then like designers and all mm-hmm. this stuff right but again like you said there's so many other roles mm-hmm. how can people go in and find those opportunities find those roles and start getting that foot in the door and creating opportunities for themselves and not just working at an outlet and then six years go by and they're still working at an outlet. I would say um, tenacity because when I told you I applied for, you know, more than 70 jobs to get out here, it would be really easy to get down on yourself Mm -hmm. when you don't get the role that you're, that you're really wanting. And I had my heart broken several times where I got far along in the process and then didn't get the job. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, perseverance Mm -hmm. patience and keeping your eyes fixed on the prize of what it is that you want to get to also having um a target like knowing what your target is so i can't draw for anything i didn't even know what a plm was my target was just to get to w HQ world okay. headquarters. That right. was my target. Like, I just need to be out there. Knowing what I know now, I'd probably have a little bit different target. Probably would have went to school for a different thing. Mm-hmm. But like, I wouldn't change anything because the journey is what made me who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, but my goal was to get to WHQ, so that's why I like I got in as a customer service rep, mm-hmm. which is like being on a retail floor, but with the buffer of a telephone or um, the internet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then from there, I was able to make the connections and put two and two together and say, all right, this product line management thing, this is what I want to pursue. 
But, you know, maybe you have a degree in finance or, uh, you know, you can go into uh, textiles and like materials. Maybe mm-hmm. you're a materials expert. Like there's just, again, no shortage of, of avenues. So I would say like instead of having a buckshot approach and just, you know, you know, shooting everywhere, it's right. like, nah, have a more targeted laser-like focus on the area that you want to get in. Mm-hmm. And then um, I'd say LinkedIn is your friend, man. Like LinkedIn reach, now. reach out to people, yeah. you know, like yeah. I'm not above cold calling somebody and like emailing somebody out of the blue if I get a connection. And um, when you get to meet with somebody, ask them for some more people to meet with. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, when, you know, when I met with Gentry, I was like, can you give me some more people that I should meet with? He gave me like three names. Mm-hmm. So then you take those three names and you get another three names. And then you take those nine names and you get mm-hmm. another three names. Now you're at 27. And like what you're doing is you're expanding your network and it will it will pay dividends, but it does not pay off instantly. Mm-hmm. Like it is about perseverance and patience and just like staying true to, to what you want to achieve. So like don't get frustrated if you don't get the first job you apply for because hi- hyper comp- competitive and getting in there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, but like once you're in, you're in. So and, and then also tell them too about like when you work at Nike, you could get that job that you wanted. And six months later, you could have a whole different job. Yeah. And you just bounce it around. You do it yep. like and that's just it's a part of the thing. Things, yeah. Things change, teams change, you know, organizational structures change. So I, I would say in my time there I was there 16 years, I probably had a dozen jobs in the time that I was there. So never really in a job more than like a year, year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I tried to use every aspect of each of those positions to um, put more arrows in my quiver, if mm-hmm. you will, mm-hmm. more tools in my tool belt to make me more useful to, you know, whatever organization I ended up with. Don't let the, don't let the brand use you, use, you use the brand right, right. to build your own um, experience, mm-hmm. you know? I like that. So, okay. Rapid fire. And then we'll get out of here. What's the greatest sneaker of all time? Air Jordan 3, Black Cement. Ooh, okay. So if you could only wear one shoe for the rest of your life, what would it be? Air Foot Skate Woven. Ugh, that's your shit. I know you was going to pick that one. <laughs> okay. Um, where do you see the shoe game going in the next couple of years with these bots and the internet and all the different stuff? Like, just the culture. Since you, you know, that's kind of... Yeah, that's my you... wheelhouse. Um, I don't think hype is going anywhere, but I also think like... Um, when everything is hype, nothing is hype. So True. if you look at the brands right now, there's two brands that are killing it, according to Wall Street. On mm-hmm. and Hoka. Mm-hmm. You see any hype releases from them? Nope. It's all about consumption to wear. Yep. People are buying their product to wear it. They're mm-hmm. not buying it to hoard it. So we're at a tipping point in terms of resale, collectability, Um, I personally have been, I've bought the same shoes multiple times before. Like anytime the black cement three comes out, I'm buying two pair, maybe three. Right. You know, every time, but I buy those to wear, I don't buy them to, to stack and Mm -hmm. resell. So we're at a point where, um, the, um, if you just look at stock X or goat, like stuff isn't commanding the same prices that it was, uh, you know, three years yeah, ago, say, especially during COVID. <laughs> yeah, it's like well, everyone had them stimmy checks. Mm-hmm. No stimmy checks right now. Right. Everybody so then, like when you look at the macro <laughs> level influence of how the economy is doing right now, probably the last thing on people's minds is dropping a thousand dollars on you know resale value on on a sneaker. Mm-hmm. So I personally would like to see it get back to you know people wearing what they like because they like it. Not because, you know, it has resale value, Mm -hmm. but as long as something has resale value, people are going to make money. So I'm not, I don't hate on resellers like, yo, like get your bread, you know? Um, But I do think like we've reached a point of saturation Mm -hmm. on it and the market always has a way of correcting itself. Mm -hmm. So then I said cyclical ebbs and flows, right? So what's that mean? A lot more people going to lose their job at Nike and Jordan or what? I I can't say that. I don't, you know. Because I, you know. 
I mean, if they stop selling as many units, somebody gonna have to get cut. But uh, that's a that's a that's a possibility, I would say. <laughs> you know, um, but like the other possibility is is they shift that to to other areas of their product. Mm-hmm. You know, so find a new way. Yeah, find yeah. a new way to make make more money. And um, uh, but yeah, if you look at the brands that are killing it right now, and like sneakerheads don't really be talking about like hoka or on like that but like what they do is they make an authentic product for a purpose and people resonate with that product i'm a runner now right just so you know oh like, yeah i know you know yo, i'm a runner in. and i run in hoka uh bondi's because like they really make a great product that um i feel has like it's worth the money it lasts long enough and it like really helps make running sucks, man. But mm-hmm. like it helps make my runs easier, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So that's why brands like that are winning right now. And I think New Balance is doing really good. Uh, they've kind of entered into the streetwear space, and they've done a lot of like really cool collabs. But the one thing that you you never hear anyone say about New Balance, you never hear them talking trash about their quality. Never, ever, never, because they put good materials on their shoes. Because so, what are you saying about Nike? I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I was talking about New Balance. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah, for real though. So, like, when y- you know, you know, quality. Whenever you feel mm-hmm. it, uh, there was a quote, uh, all uh, from one of the the members of um, the Gucci family that uh, price will be forgotten long after quality is remembered. Mm-hmm. I believe that's the quote. Something like that. Though. Yeah, I like something that. to that effect. That, that I may sense. have butchered it, but like. If it's a good quality product and it lasts, you don't worry about paying quite as much for it. That's true. Okay. Final words. You got anything you would say to your old young self or to your old young self, mm. <laughs> to your young self back in the day or to your kids or, you know, what is that? What is that uh, final quote before you go? Man, I was always trying to tell my kids to um, to uh, find something that you're good at mm-hmm. and like do that. You know, and then find a way to get paid for it because, again, till till I win the Powerball, I'm working. So, like, I want my kids to enjoy what they do. Uh, anybody that's out there, life is too short to find yourself in a in a in a role that you hate. So, you know, find your passion and then figure out a way to. Um, don't take no for an answer. Figure out a way to get into it and and get your bread. I love it. Well, that's going to do it. We're going to wrap this one up. I appreciate you guys for subscribing and watching. If you guys enjoyed this, again, subscribe. You made it this far into the video and you have not subscribed. That's actually crazy. So you should probably hit the subscribe button at this point. But uh, I appreciate you. And uh, if they want you back, I'm down to have you back because we got plenty more stuff we can talk about. Yes, sir. (laughs) I appreciate it, bro. (laughs)